Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to OzCastNetwork.com for details. John Cadogan's mission as auto expert is to get you into the right car at the right price. He has a degree in mechanical engineering, and for 25 years he's been reporting on the car industry, automotive consumer issues, and reviewing cars in print, online, and on radio and TV. Paul and Tim met with John to talk about how to save thousands on new cars in the showroom today. Paul Atherton is an ex-Wall Street advisor on a mission to help young people win back their financial power, wealth and security. He does this by helping them understand the hidden world of finance, risk and investments, helps them figure out how it impacts them and to seize the opportunities to make it work to their advantage. This is Paul Street Journal. Thank you for joining us, John Cadogan. It's a pleasure. First, I just have some some questions about buying cars. You would know that they're probably the the second biggest purchase of of anyone's life, generally speaking. I mean, we can obviously go through buying secondhand cars, but new cars especially are generally a very big commitment. Uh, Just on this point of cars being expensive too, and I I take your point entirely that they are the second most expensive thing that most people ever buy, but... What I want you to do is a thought experiment like this. Okay, let's go back in time mentally 20 years. The base model Toyota Corolla 20 years ago was $19,990, right? Mm. And if you come forward to today, the base model Corolla, until they released the uh, the current model about three days ago, the base model uh, of, for all of this year has been 19990 or thereabouts. Mm. So over 20 years, the affordability of new cars has actually jumped into the express elevator and hammered the button mark basement. So mm. they are still expensive, but the in real terms, in terms of their uh, average weekly earnings required to procure a car, they're much more affordable now than at any other time. And that's being reflected out there on the road because the average age of vehicles is dropping, which is a good thing for all kinds of things, including efficiency, air pollution, and importantly, if you're driving right now, safety. Mm. I think if you think about that, it's not only bringing the same price, but the amount that uh, you get for that uh, dollar now. Oh, there's so much more, yes. In modern cars, you've got uh, all this safety technology that wouldn't have been there 20 years ago, things like autonomous emergency braking, which will slam the brakes on, you know, if you're not paying attention, uh, which is a good thing. That was unheard of 20 years ago, and it's available in mundane cars today. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, and if you see the The rates of which uh, there are deaths on the road, which are always terrible, but it's gone down massively. If you ever see what, it hit its peak, I think, in the 70s. But the safety features you get on a standard model now are quite amazing. So it's true. Yeah, I I think that's that's right, John. It's a good way to look at it. Can I ask you, you know, I often get people asking me, like, they've they've run out of money and they don't have money. I said, usually the answer might be parked in their garage. What's the what's the kind of a mistake people make when they um, purchase a car if they uh, let's say type for money? I'd suggest that the car industry, particularly if you're buying a new car, right? The car industry is an absolute genius collectively at getting you in at uh, with an expectation of spending. I don't know. Let's pull a figure out of the air. 30 grand. Mm. And then seeing you leave the dealership having spent 40 or 45 yeah. and wondering, get the, did someone get the number of that truck that just hit me? So it's extremely easy to overspend on cars and the whole industry is, is designed to upsell you. There's a continuous upselling process that is like an endurance event from hell when you're at a dealership. Mm. And not only will you be uh, tested, if you like, to buy a car that's much more expensive than the one you've got, the finance can be really expensive. They'll want to sell you all the accessories. And mm. it just goes on and on and on until, you know, the, the industrial grade Dyson gets hooked up to your bank account. And unless you're good at saying no, <laughs> your bank account will be emptied. Yeah. And so if you go in without prepped into a dealership, if you see somebody do that, I guess you'll be shaking your head. Don't, don't do that because you're not gonna you're not gonna leave with your wallet uh, full. Well, it's an adversarial process. It's like yeah. it's not an adversarial process like being in a deleted scene from Kill Bill or something. <laughs> it's it's quite a refined, civilized process, but it is designed to extract as much money from you as possible. And people make these fundamental mistakes like. 
they ask the salesman for advice. Mm. And <laughs> this is a conflict of interest, right? Because yeah. the, <laughs> the, the salesman is going to give you advice that serves his best interests, not yours. And then they make all these other mistakes, like they don't realise that most people carry out three transactions when they're at the dealership. Mm. And they think about the new car, but they don't also think that they are conducting a sale transaction on their old car as in the form of a trade-in, which is frankly all about convenience and not about value. <laughs> and then they might also procure the finance as well as a whole bunch of ancillary things like insurance and yeah. uh, accessories and the paint protection and, and the stuff goes on and on. Can I, can I ask you, John, so here's a right to that point. Um, I had a friend who said they got a great deal on the interest they pay on the car. So they went to a, I forget what who the dealer was and what the make was, but they said, you know, they were paying a very low percentage. And all I could think was that just mean you pay more for the car because they would have been better than the price. Is this the type of shenanigans that goes on that they give you one and take with the other? Well, absolutely. There's a fantastic book by Malcolm Gladwell, and it deals with the phenomenon of thin slicing, which is that in a complex situation, human beings make decisions based on a thin slice of information. So mm. a good salesman will know that, and they'll get you to focus on the price of the car, like, hey, look at the price of the car, or hey, look at this unbeatable interest rate. Now, mm. if the cash rate set by the Reserve Bank of Australia is 1.5%, and it's been there for donkey's years, mm. then if someone is offering you interest at 1%, they're taking a bath on it by definition. And the car industry and the finance industry has a, a proud tradition of not taking a bath on that. So you're obviously paying what they call subvented finance. And basically what they're doing is they're not offering you the same discount upfront as they would if you were paying cash. And they're using that additional margin to pay the financier a real interest rate under the table that is not only undisclosed, mm. but unlike a conventional finance arrangement, that interest is being paid by you up front. You're not paying for it over time. You're paying for it all then and there on the showroom floor. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And a, a little bit of advice I try and give is if you want finance, go to a bank. If you want insurance, go to an insurance company. So you should really more walk into a dealer just to buy a car. Well, that's absolutely right. Here's another couple of classic scams, right? Mm. All modern cars for donkey's years have been galvanised. If you're as old as me, you'll recognise that in the 70s and the 80s, you walked around the street and you saw all these cars, 10 years old, parked on the side of the road, and they were rusty. They were really rusty. And in fact, that right. was a major reason to be declined for registration. Hmm. So fast forward to today, and you just don't see that phenomenon because car bodies are all galvanised now. And galvanising sets up a cathodic protection reaction that stops the steel from rusting using zinc. It's the same way they prevent ships from rusting in the ocean. Anyway, a car dealer will happily sell you rust protection all day long, except you don't mm. need it because the car is already protected from rust as it emerges from the factory. And when it comes to things like insurance, you know, the insurance that a dealer will sell you is exactly the same insurance that you can get from, say, Allianz, and it's just mm. rebranded. It's a white it's label product, and it'll be sold yeah. to you with something like a 100% markup, and it's completely wow. unjustifiable and undisclosed. And that's the point, I think. It's just... All of these extra add-ons and bits and pieces that just boy, you can you, <laughs> like you said, you go into with thirty thousand as your as your price, but you leave with forty thousand out of your pocket. <laughs> um, what what are some of the other things that uh, keep in mind, John, when you walk into a dealer? The trade-in is the other classic way to to take a bath, right? So trade-ins are all about convenience because it is a bit of a pain to go and list your car on Gumtree or whatever mm. and have no-shows come to your home and obviously... If you're a young person, you're probably busy at work. It's hard to make the time to, and it's very frustrating when people don't turn up. And if you're an old person, like an old lady living on your own, it's a potential security risk to have, mm. you know, who, someone you don't know turn up at your home and potentially case the joint when they're notionally looking at your car. So for all these reasons, a trade-in is convenient. But if you go in there with no idea about the underlying value of the car that you are about to sell to that dealer, then you can take a bath on that. And let's say they uh, underquote you on the trade-in and you don't know and there's five grand in it for them, then they can give you an unbeatable price on the new car and you can focus on that price and go, hey, I'm getting a great deal. And in fact, yeah. you're not. You're taking a bath at the other end of it. Mm. 
So th- a thin slice again. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to think about the deal in its totality or else you've got to separate those transactions. You've got to say, you know what, I'm going to just endure the pain and I'm going to make a bit more money by selling my old car privately. I'm going to have my finance sorted when I walk through the door. I'm going to say no to all the add-ons and that way, baby, we can just talk about the price of this car, you know, and then then you've got to be an ace negotiator and there are some other tactics you can deploy in the field there to get a better deal for yourself. So what would you recommend to people who don't have much experience in negotiating? I know quite a lot of people feel uncomfortable with this. They're perhaps too polite to to negotiate. Do you have some tips to beat the dealer? Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people have this uh, notion that they need to be the salesman's friend and you don't. You don't have to be a mongrel, but you have to advocate for your own best interest. So you have to know what the fair price of that car is. And let's just say that a car is $30,000 drive away. That's the price you can see on the manufacturer's website. You should take about 20% off that. So take about six grand out of that and use that as your sort of opening position. You can say, well, I don't want to pay any more than 24 for this car. It's 30, uh, 30 drive away, you know, 24 is what I'm prepared to offer you. And the salesman can go, that's completely unrealistic. And you can say, look, I've got a maximum of 25. So you're coming up a bit and that's fair enough. You just say, look, I've got a maximum of 25. My wife, my boyfriend, my parents, whoever, are going to kill me if I spend more than 25. And it's really critical at this point (laughs) that that person whom you've abrogated the responsibility for your spending limit upon is not available. They've got to not be there with you and they've got to not be available on the phone. And all of a sudden, you know, you both want the same thing. You want the car, he wants to sell it to you. And the only impediment, the speed hump here is this mongrel who's holding your limit. Oh, that's great. Right? And and then when they say we can't do it for that price, you say, and this is the most powerful thing you can ever play on the showroom floor, is you say, sorry, we can't do business. Here's my number. If you'd like to reconsider, give me a call. And if I haven't purchased anything in the meantime, I'll come back. And uh, 25, all day long, not a problem. Thanks for your time. Walk out. Mm. And if they're under pressure at that time because you're smart enough to go in at the end of the month when car dealers are potentially under pressure to meet their sales quotas, which the manufacturers all impose on them monthly, if you get the right dealer, he's under pressure, you've offered a low price, he is going to be motivated to fall all over that deal because when they meet their sales quotas, there is an undisclosed bonus from the manufacturer that is like a pat on the head for being good boys and getting the job done. Mm. I love that. I love the the sidestepping of the adversarial process. So you're you're no longer against each other. You're almost on each other's side. It's this unknown person that can't that's not around that uh, is the, he's causing the problem. <laughs> it's perfect, and you can yeah look. You can rehearse it. You know you can go through this. But I see all these people, and I hear from buyers all the time. They've gone in as a husband and wife, or a boyfriend and a girlfriend to buy a car, mm. and for example. Either party, the boyfriend, the girlfriend might say, I love it. I've got to have it. And then the other party who might be a bit more rational about this, who wants to negotiate as opposed to just gush all over it, sort of says, hang on a minute, we've got to get this right. And we've got to be like this, right? Mm. And the salesman will seize on that and he will play the willing party against the unwilling party. Right. And then all of a sudden the wife or something is on the salesman's team and the husband is made to look like Mm. he's not getting on board here. Like, what are you doing? You know, you're a problem all of a sudden. Yeah, do you know, I I bought a car a couple of years ago and went into the dealer and I thought, well, you know, I'm pretty good at negotiating. And I was shocked at how slick, I mean, really intense they were. You know, I just thought, oh, boy, that'd be sort of amateur, maybe slightly better than the average, but they were very good. Well, it's, look, it's like this. If you go on the field with the worst Mm. Uh, against a, the worst AFL player in the league, mm-hmm. right? He's going to murder you. <laughs> even if you're right. a de- even if you True. think, you know, I'm a decent amateur foot, I've played footy all my life, right? That's it, yeah. He is going to wipe you all over the floor, right? Yeah, yeah. And they are match fit at this game. And you never want to say, you know, I'm pretty good at this mm. because you, you're an amateur. You're not doing it all day long and they absolutely are. Yeah, they're going to kick the hell out of you. So I'll tell you the end part of this process, by the way. And I, I think I got a little bit lucky and I'll tell you why. But so I'd, right when I thought I'd achieved my goal of getting the car, we were then put into another room to sit down to find the si- final paperwork and the add-on started coming in. 
It was, you know, it was the classic, you want fries with that. And it was significant. I'm like, oh, I was really tired, you know, after all this um, negotiating. I guess this is common, John, to take you into another room and boy, next thing you know, you've got thousands of extra bits and pieces that you can add on to the car. Yeah, well, look, absolutely. And people, look, I don't know, when I have a discussion with someone with someone new and I'm meeting them in a business context or I'm meeting them socially, there's a whole bunch of societal norms that underpin those interactions, right? And mm. so if you meet somebody and you're all being polite and playing by the rules, most of what is being said to you in general is uh, absolutely honest and you're all working towards a common objective. I mean, that ha- that's how it is in my life. But mm. if you go to a car dealership, you look up at the clock at the wall, right? And whatever time it's displaying, it is potentially yeah. bullshit o'clock. That's just <laughs> yeah. how it is, right? Yeah. You have to assume that everything is being that is being said to you is BS, right? And I'll give you a, an example of just how insidious this can be. And this happens all the time in sales transactions. You make a low offer, the salesman counters with an offer that he claims is a bit low, but there's probably still quite a lot of fat in it. And then he will say, look, this offer is uh, below my approval authority. I can, I'll get shot if I approve this. I'll bring the sales manager and see if he can help you out. Mm. Now, his job is not to help you out. Mm. His job is to close you and get you off the market, right? Right. So you've got to just, you've got to assume that it's all BS. And when when a salesman will say to you, and this is a classic ploy as well, they will say, look, there's a special today. I can give you this car for this price today, but that's that special price is going away when we close the door this afternoon. So if you give me a deposit right now, I can secure that car for you, and that is an unbeatable price. And people all of a sudden, they start to get worked up because they're taking this statement at face value. Yeah. And they're going like, I don't want to miss out on this unbeatable deal because tomorrow, you know, blah it's really a mistake to do this. It's so fundamental because there is no unbeatable deal today. That's BS, Mm. okay? They just want your deposit now because they know that if you walk out the door, the probability of selling you a car tomorrow or next week or next weekend, whatever it is, Mm. just jumps down and, and diminishes almost to zero. You might buy at the dealer next door or whatever. So... You just don't believe anything that you are told because it is there to serve the interest of the guy selling it to you because you're in the ring with Iron Mike and it just it, <laughs> it doesn't feel like that, but that's what you're doing, right? Yeah. It's like they're, like you are saying, I guess, their worst at the game is going to be much better than you at your best. On a bad day, they're pretty slick. Exactly. And back to my, my original story there about going in, I got a bit lucky, it turns out, because I was watching this on your, your fantastic Uh, YouTube station, I got a bit lucky because I happened to be negotiating on the end of the day of a Saturday at the end of the month. And Well, this is a good time to do it, yeah. And it was, it turns out that that's probably was in my adva- to my advantage. Do you, want, do you want to tell us why? Look, th- there's two things there. The end of the month, which we discussed before, is why car dealers are under pressure because there is immense pressure to sell. Mm-hmm. All of those brands, Nissan, Honda, Hyundai, Kia, whatever, they're all imposing these very tight sales quotas on their dealers. They want to move that metal because if you make cars, you're in, a, you're in an environment where there's a, a great deal of capital cost involved in the production of cars. It's expensive to ship them around the place. So there's a very simple equation. Mm. Production has to equal sales. Otherwise you go out the back door. So there's immense pressure to sell. Car dealers get paid handsomely if they meet their their quotas. And if they don't, the river of gold does not open from the manufacturer. So there's that. Mm. And the other thing about being there and looking at that car is Mm. if a car is in stock now at that dealership, the dealer is highly motivated to get rid of it in the way that they are not if they have to order it in for you. And this is because when you see that car on the showroom floor or in the holding yard out the back, the dealer has already purchased it and they've paid for it on credit and the interest is burning a hole in their pocket and they want to shift that car. Mm. So that's good for you if it's the car you want, but then it's bad for you if you ask the dealer for advice about which car you want, right. because nine times out of 10, he's going to look out the back and see what he's got in stock and say, this is perfect for you. Yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> it may not Whatever be. he needs to clear his inventory is going to be perfect. It's going to be perfect for him. Exactly. Yeah. So a good tool would be then to pretend as if you don't want one of the cars in the yard and then get 
the dealer to offer you one of the cars in the yard at a better price. The classic thing is colour. You know, if you want a bright red Mazda 3 SP25 GT hatch and the one you're looking at that the dealer owns is blue or silver or whatever, then you could basically honestly say to them, Mm. then, you know, mate, I want a red one. You've got a blue one. Mm. And if you give me an unbeatable price, I'll take it, but I really want red. Mm. Or fortuitously enough, if you're actually looking at a red one and you want a red one, you could say, mate, I really want silver. (laughs) Yeah. And you should not feel bad about it. Like, do not feel bad about doing this because whatever... Whatever small morsel of bullshit that you can serve up in uh, at your end of the deal, you know that from the other end there's an absolute degustation of the stuff, a, a tsunami of BS flowing from the other end. So don't feel bad about yeah. it. I, uh, I remember a very specific situation being present for um, when my parents were buying one of their cars. Uh, an Alfa Romeo probably to your detest, but <laughs> my my dad was was low balling uh, on the demo model when you know said two thousand dollars or whatever below what the, the <laughs> they had just offered him and and then they came down five hundred dollars and because uh, my mum was present and didn't kind of catch on to what my dad was doing she was like oh that's a good price and just immediately <laughs> lost all of dad's negotiating power by mm. reacting to the <laughs> mm. to the second offer um, so I guess you have to kind of be careful who who you bring you with you and yeah exactly kind of using uh, non-present people to, to your advantage because it it does seem like as if the odds are stacked against you look i think if you're going in as a team a, a couple going in to buy a car or something or mm. dad and son or daughter going in to buy a car you have to have a discussion up front and you have to say look mm. we're going into an adversarial environment and here is the game that we're going to play mm. you know mm. if you want to have a discussion about whether you really want to take that car or whether that price is okay, Mm. then you are insane, like clinically insane if you have that discussion (laughs) within earshot of the salesman. Oh, yeah. Instead of that, why don't you just say, well, thank you for making that offer. We'll just go and consider that. We'll go for a walk around the showroom for Mm. or out on the out on the forecourt. We'll just go for a walk for 10 or 15 minutes. We'll talk it over and we'll see where we are on this Mm. and we'll come back to you. And that way you will not be sending any signals to them Mm. that they can go and exploit tactically against you. Mm. It's also amazing how the dealers try and extract, to your point there, John, how they try and extract or try, they do extract lots of information from you in that casual conversation. You know, what what do you do? How much do you earn? Are you cash buying? You know, so on, so on, so forth. Well, the other thing that they will try and do is figure out where you're at on the purchasing landscape, right? So Mm. if they find out from you, that you've just been to their competitor three suburbs over and you're not happy with that deal because right. you believe that they tried to fleece you on the trade-in. Yeah. And then a good salesman will say to you, well, let's have a look at your trade-in, you know, and how much did they offer you? And, and then you'll go, oh, that just, you know, blah, they offered me eight grand. Mm. And the, he'll come back and say, oh, look, I think we can, we can offer you much more than that. We'll give you 10. Yeah. Okay. Now your car might be worth twelve. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's still a good deal for him. Yeah. And then and then when you start to talk about the price of the new car, he's gonna know that you're more or less over the line on this. Mm. So it's not gonna take much of a nudge to sell you the new car at the high price. And then mm. if you argue the toss about the price of the new car, claiming that it's a bit high, he can always fall back on what he's just done and said, But mate, I'm giving you an unbeatable deal on the trade in here and we've got to make a profit somehow. How am I gonna feed my family? if I give it all away to you at cost. (laughs) Yeah. So it seems as if there's basically two things you need to do. You need to have a a discussion about what you're going to do before you head into the dealer and you need to do your research about exactly what kind of car and what you're prepared to pay for it essentially beforehand. So it's not the kind of activity that you do on a Sunday afternoon kind of whimsically. It's it's something you need to be very prepared for. You, you do your homework beforehand. Absolutely. And you've got to not ask the dealer for advice. That's a, that's a classic mistake as well because yeah. you're going there. It's a shop. You're going there to buy whatever. And there's a salient difference between mm. going to Bing Lee or something in the market for a television and going to a car dealer. And the salient difference is. Mm. When you go to Bing Lee, you can see a Sony TV next to a Panasonic TV, next to some Chinese knockoffs, next to a Samsung. And then there's the whole range of competitive, Mm. I don't know, 55 inch TVs up there. And you can talk about the differences. You cannot do this at a car dealer. They're only there to sell you a Honda or a Hyundai or whatever. Mm. 
So you've got to know what you want and you've got to know how much it's worth and you've got to know what a fair rate for the finance is and you've got to know how much your trade-in mm. is worth mm. and you've got to have a game plan about saying no to all of that stuff. Yeah. Because at the end of this incredible endurance event when your resistance is at an all-time low and the blonde statuesque uh, accessories girl mm. walks in with a with a top half unbuttoned. It's so easy to say yes, mm -hmm. you know, yes to the paint protection and all of that. And every time, it's just another five hundred here, another thousand there, and they just they they're, they're just going kaching 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 kaching, and you're just mm. going, oh, please God, let just this end. It up. <laughs> and that's not even the dealer. That's that's literally just the accessories girl who's come in and is making commission off all of those purchases, like ridiculous commission. It's almost that, like a lot of them are third parties. So I, just for context here, I have a sister mm. who is actually one of those accessories girls and, and she real. will admit proudly like that she's quite good at, you know, the, the flirtatious yeah. uh, right. you know, sell, if that makes sense. You wow. know, so men and perhaps in their you know, 40s and over, she's just just turns up the dial on them and yeah. kind of yeah, empties oh, their empties oh, their wallet. It's oh <laughs> well, it's really interesting inside the car industry. If you talk to senior executives, there's a mm. there's a term for that occupation, and I don't know if you remember Ming. You know, Ming used to be that car protection stuff in the 70s and 80s that you'd, right. you know, it was a car protection product. It was called Ming, M-I-N-G, like Ming the Merciless from Flash Gordon, okay? And in the industry today, if you talk to insiders, right. you they will talk to you about the Ming mold. Oh, really? Right? And that's what, they, that's what they call that, you know, and I don't seek to disparage your sister here. She's obviously not one of those, but, you know, that is <laughs> yeah. the colloquial expression inside the industry right? for the girl who sends, who sells that stuff with the top two buttons under. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Classic. Mm. Uh, another question sort of slightly off, off centre from what we're discussing, or maybe it isn't, but if I buy a $30,000 car, just Camry, I don't know, brand new, and I drive it home, park it in the, at home, the value of that car has now gone down massively. Or well, so they say. Oh, tell me, what what what's is there any rule of thumb on on that brand new car? Drive it home. It's you know, you've just wiped out X amount. Oh, it's several thousand dollars. It's probably you know five or ten thousand dollars because if you went back to the dealer and said, look, how much will you purchase this from uh, back from me? He'd probably say twenty grand, twenty two, something like that. Really. Wow. And yeah, but but too much is made of this, right? Too much is absolutely because nobody does that mm. statistically. Nobody nobody buys a new car and sells right. it next week. Or yeah. if you do, your world has absolutely turned on a sixpence and something terrible has happened to you. Correct. It's a statistical anomaly. Depreciation's a big deal though, because mm. this is the other classic way to get burnt on the deal. Because if you buy a car that is a depreciation disaster, mm. then you're gonna take a bath when it's trade-in time in three, five, six, seven years, whatever it is. Mm. So you've got to do your research there too about which cars you're going to buy and not buy ones that are declining in popularity now. The Australian Bureau of Statistics recently released its motor vehicle census for 2018 and this charted in part the number of uh, the mix of cars out there on the road by brands and the biggest loser among the top 30 cars was Ford. Wow. There are from memory, there are 22% fewer Fords on the road today compared with the number in 2013, and that is a reduction of about 380,000 Fords out there on the road. So mm. the price of used cars is driven almost exclusively by supply and demand, and if the demand for Ford is falling through the floor now, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't be buying one as a hedge against depreciation. And just to put depreciation in perspective, right, Australians hate buying fuel. It's a, the ultimate grudge purchase. Yeah, that's you, right. you only do it because if you don't, your car's going to be roadside furniture. Yeah. Okay, so... The amount that you will pay in depreciation for an average $30,000 car over five years is more than the fuel. And the only reason we're not rioting in the street about that is because, you know, you, you don't pay it monthly at the post office. You pay it in five years' time and everybody goes, oh, okay, when the trade-in offer comes in. Yeah. Depreciation is a serious thing and there can be several thousand dollars worth of difference between competing cars in the same segment. So if you bet on the right horse, you can be a real winner in three to five years' time. Mm. And to knock off that depreciation, is it worthwhile to buy off the lot from the dealer the one that has several thousand 
kilometers on it. The or demo, it, the demo model. Maybe mm. the demo model, or is there a way, or is that just a bit of a, you know, a nonsense game that won't get you what you you're, you're looking? Oh no, I'd say in some cases demonstrators offer significant value, but you have to be a bit careful because when you go to review websites like mine and you yeah. you see, uh, for example, SUVs that are driven through, uh, they're, they're driven on the beach and through the, 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 the wavelets lapping up on the edge where the water meets the sand and sprays going everywhere and it looks fantastic, mm. that's going to be sold as a demonstrator, that car. <laughs> and I don't want to buy, you know, oh. when you talk to a salesman, yeah. remember the clock on the wall, always BS a clock. Yeah. They will tell you that that demonstrator was a former senior executive's car. Right. Right? Yeah. That was the sales manager's car. Well, that was a uh, a Holden senior executive's car. Yeah. When, in fact, it it, it made its debut on the road for the press launch and 100 journalists drove it through salt water at 100 k's an hour (laughs) and we detailed it. That's the truth, right? The other thing about demonstrators is they get crashed. Oh, the crash rate among uh, media evaluation cars, letting the cat right out of the bag, is horrendous really? because these vehicles wow. are all being, you know, they're being driven by people who are evaluating them and they don't have ownership skin in the game. So they don't care about those cars as much as you would as an owner. And therefore, if you are buying a demonstrator, it is absolutely incumbent on you to get an independent mechanical inspection of that car to just make sure that it has not been abused or crashed Mm. because abuse and damage is not covered by the manufacturer's warranty, even if you aren't the bunny who abused or damaged the car. So (laughs) if the problem that you experience with your electrical system is as a result of 100k an hour salt water injection from driving along the edge of the Pacific Ocean, Mm. that's not a warrantable defect. Right, yeah. So you just you 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 bought that you bought that uh, that problem and how would you how would you know is there a way to for discovery Yeah, I'd suggest that the independent mechanical inspection. So if you've got a, a mechanic that you know, like your local guy who's independent, mm. bring him along to inspect the demonstrator or tell the uh, dealership. Particularly if this is a demonstrator with five thousand Ks on it or something, mm. then you've got to tell the dealership that you want to have that car independently inspected to see that it hasn't been crashed and to, and to have a look a reasonable look into its mechanical condition. You're going to take it to your mechanic. He's going to put it up on the hoist and have a look, and they might give you all the all the reasons in the world why that can't happen. But you have to ask yourself why would there be an objection if it was a former senior executive's car that was only ever driven from home to the office and back or something and then to soccer and the shops on the weekend. If that's the case, then what's the problem with having a qualified mechanic look at the car? And if there is some insurmountable problem, you'd have to have a look at the clock on the wall and just check the time briefly, wouldn't you? (laughs) Yeah. So, John, I was just hoping what research should people be doing to determine what car is right for them before they walk through that door? Because like you said, you can't compare or you can't compare Hondas to Toyotas perhaps in the same showroom because they won't be there. And uh, obviously the car manufacturer doesn't make self-competing models. Absolutely. Okay. So here's how I'd approach looking for the right new car. I think buyers basically define themselves principally by spending capacity. So you have to know how much you're prepared to spend on a car and Frankly, I don't think you should extend yourself too far because, you know, whatever whatever the amount is, don't spend 25% more than that because servicing the debt will just be onerous and surely the money could be devoted to something else. If you're a complete enthusiast and you've always lusted after a WRX STI or something or a Hyundai i30N or some car like that, then you know what you want and you have to then make friends with how much it's going to cost you and whether you can afford it. But price is the principle uh, determinant. And if, you, if you're not a car enthusiast, then you can get a car that suits your needs and won't break the bank. Even if you have to buy a used car, that's fine. Get a late model used car with some vestigial you know, warranty and that's fine. Then you've got to look at what sort of car you want. You know, SUVs are very popular, for example, with families and uh, particularly young families. They've become the de facto family wagon. Mm. The reality there, however, is that compared with a car that's approximately the same size, you will pay five to $10,000 more for an SUV. So you'd have to make friends with that. Mm. So 
then you've got to categorise what sort of car you want. Zippy little city car, you want a long distance tourer, go down that track about which one. And then you've got to figure out which ones to eliminate. Mm. And I'd suggest that the dud brands are the ones to eliminate first. You know, the ACCC came out mm. within the past 12 months with a scathing report about how the car industry deals with customers who have problems with their cars. Yeah. We have we have good consumer laws in Australia about, with, you know, with consumer guarantees. You can Google ACCC and consumer guarantees and educate yourself on them. The problem, however, is the enforcement of those laws when you've got car companies and other corporations behaving badly. And that, that is the real problem. So the next thing I would do there is I would eliminate the bad brands from the mix of vehicles that I'm considering. And uh, because companies can't sue you for defamation under Australian law, I'd suggest that uh, Holden and Ford, for example, are two of the worst operators. They've got uh, substantial court enforceable undertakings currently in play with the ACCC. Volkswagen is uh, also a very poor operator in my view. They've, uh, you know, they're, in, they're doing battle with the ACCC in federal court at the moment. And uh, when you hark back to Ford, they've just had to pay a $10 million fine for their unconscionable conduct concerning the power shift transmission in the Focus, Fiesta and EcoSport for donkey's years, essentially leaving a bunch of uh, consumers out in the cold. Wow. So, you know, Jeep is a, is a dud as well, in my view. Mercedes-Benz doesn't look after its customers very well, mm. nor does Audi. You know, if mm. I was going to buy one of those premium German cars, I'd be shopping at House of BMW or I'd consider Lexus as an alternative mm. because they're just better at looking after their customers. And this mm. this affects you if you've got a problem in, you know, 12 months' time. If you've got a serious problem and they're not playing ball, this can be the headache from hell and you really don't want it. So that's the, the next step I'd go through is eliminate the dud brands from the mix mm. and just shop with operators who are going to shop with companies that are going to look after you if you've got a genuine issue. That's a really good point, John. And to that, I, I, I had the following discussion with a friend of mine because I'm a big fan of Toyota and slash Lexus because a big, a big priority for me is reliability. I just can't stand the thought of having to take it in all the time um, to get fixed. Just That just boggles my mind. And, you know, Toyota, Lexus, they just have such good reliability. And so my friend said, and he, he's a listener of this podcast, so maybe you can put one of us straight. He said, uh, you know, modern cars, they're all the same. So pretty much that from a reliability perspective, you're, it's all pretty much a wash. <laughs> it's a brave statement. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, well, he and I could have a heated discussion about that, uh, <laughs> respectfully. <laughs> well, we, I, we started, but I, I, I didn't have any data to back myself up, so I just said, no, I'll stick with uh, Toyota, yeah. Look, I think, well, I think there are two things, you know, there's a lot of off the shelf technology, mm. like, uh, for example, adaptive cruise control is a radar sensing unit and a computer that makes some decisions and some other hardware in the car and car makers buy them off the shelf from mm. third party suppliers to the car industry like Bosch or Johnson Controls or uh, TRW or whatever. Right. So mm. those systems are probably equally reliable in a Mercedes Benz, a Toyota, a Hyundai, a Jeep, whatever, mm. but cars are complex machines. Uh, for example, there are 50 or 60 different electronic control units, which you might think about as little black boxes that are essentially computers all hooked up in a wired network called the controller area network in the car. And they all interact with each other and the transmission talks to the engine and the engine talks to the brakes. And, you know, it's very complex. And in very complex systems, because I was an engineer before I was a journalist. In very complex systems, there's a feedback effect. There's always feedback effects. And these systems are so complex that you can't define all the feedback mechanisms at the outset. Mm. So there are more problems with some brands than others. And I'll give you an example. Back about, I don't know, 10 years ago, Volkswagen said, we will become the number one car company in the world, right? And then a bean counter at Wolfsburg uh, sort of knocked on the boss's door and said, um, mm. what's the effect of? Uh, mate, we don't actually have enough different cars in enough different segments to do that. And there was an edict to roll out as many new models to fill up those gaps segmentally. <laughs> And reliability just jumped through the floor because they were rolled out in great haste. Aye. And so Volkswagens are beautiful cars to look at. They're great cars to drive and their reliability is below average. Mm. And the quadruple whammy of those things is 
and that car maker has a bad reputation for customer support. So right. I think yeah. I think that last point is more important than reliability. So your friend and I could form an agreement, a loose sort of partial agreement, like we could have a demilitarized zone on reliability. <laughs> right. And the determinant <laughs> could be, well, if all cars are equally sort of equally reliable because they got sort of the same technology in them, mm. then the determinant is who's going to look after you and who isn't. Because if you've got a problem and a car maker says, that's terrible, I'm sorry to hear that, mm. we're going to fix it. We're going to replace that car. We're going to fix that, whatever. Mm and they fix it, then you're going to go, this is great. That's like buying an iPhone and taking it back to Apple and they say, oh, that I'm terribly sorry, that's a dead iPhone, here's a new one. You never get a problem about that. And you go, they're great. Mm. But if they let you down badly and your car's in the workshop for three months and they kind of forget about it and they don't ring you, and then this is a very disheartening proposition because A, you need the car to get around and B, you're still making the payments and you don't have it. Yeah, that's right. So if, you, if it's a car that's very commoditized. There's so many sales, like I would say a Toyota Corolla, for example. It's far more likely to get a higher reliability, but certainly from a you know customer service and getting that any issues that are that might rise to get that sorted much quicker. Well, yeah, absolutely. They do in service testing with cars, like obviously mm. car companies react to the ownership experience following the launch of a new model. So quite often they discover problems in service and they have recall and service campaigns to fix those. And then they implement running fixes on the production line to deal with the future models that they'll sell. So that that all makes comparative sense. But not all cars are equal in terms of the sales volume, so the research samples are all uh, different. I'd suggest that cars like Camrys, which are sold in huge volumes all around the world, do have uh, much larger metadata samples for analysis than, you know, cars like Alfa Romeos, which tend to be a bit specialised and only mm. only procured typically by people who are the sort of who. <laughs> who are masochists to some extent, let's put it that way. It, or, yeah. or at best, it's a love-hate relationship, often with cars like that. Yeah. And I think you also have to consider that the aftermarket is also much more prepared for a car that sells well as opposed to a car that doesn't sell well. So you also have to consider that the cost of re... For the aftermarket, the cost of making spare parts when they're making a lot of them is far less than when they're making few of them. So for a Corolla, you might find an air filter in the aftermarket is, you know, Thirty, forty dollars for an Alfa Romeo might be a hundred, just because they're not producing many of them. Yeah, and this plays out into the servicing of cars too, which is uh, which is a considerable expense. But you know, service intervals have extended somewhat, and you're typically only paying for a service every six to twelve months now, depending on how many k's you drive. Now, the problem with buying some of these niche brands, let's look at something like Citroen or Peugeot. Right, Citroen sells about. 1,200 to 1,500 cars in Australia, and this this is annually mm. in a market of, you know, 1.1, 1.2 million motor vehicle sales. So they're very small fish, and Peugeot sells about mm. 4,000 cars from memory. So these are quite small players. If you want to shop around for service, mm. then how many mechanics are you going to find in your local area who are Peugeot specialists or Citroen specialists, oh, yeah. whereas if you roll up to any mechanic in your Camry, yeah, right, of course. Yeah. they're not going to go, oh, mate, I've never, never seen, seen that. Those yeah, before. that's right. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, commoditized versus specialized, isn't it? And any times you've got a specialized service, there's a premium to pay. Well, that's right. And if you buy a BMW and they tell you the brakes are going to cost a thousand bucks, then you bought a BMW snob effect. It's a premium product, right? And this is the cost of the badge. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, John, just as a final question to, to wrap up, I'm hoping you may have some ideas about what car owners can expect to pay in maintenance of vehicles. I mean, with houses, we, we have a rule where we say perhaps 1% of the cost of the house you spend in maintenance per year. Do you have any similar kind of rule with a, with a car? Like, let's say you spend $30,000 on a car. I know that, you know, we're kind of comparing different brands, but is there some guide you can give us about how much people should be putting away, putting away in their kind of safety accounts to, to maintain a car. Look, I think if you've got 30 grand to spend on a car, either in cash or you're borrowing it, then you can afford to service it for the first five years because not too many major things will go wrong if you take care of it as long as you don't drive like some peanut, mm. okay? Mm. An average service, like if you buy, uh, most cars now have 12 months and 10 to 15,000 kilometre service intervals. The average car in Australia 
Australia drives about 15,000 k's a year, according to Ausstat. So, for example, if you buy a Hyundai or a Kia, they've got 12-month, 15,000-kilometre servicing intervals. So you'll need one service per year yeah. if you're an average driver, and it's going to cost you like 400 bucks. So, mm. you know, if you've got 100 uh, bucks a week spent on fuel and you're paying the uh, the loan on the car at something like 400 bucks a month or something, then you've got the 400 bucks annually to spend on servicing the car and scrimping on it is absolutely nuts because it will void your warranty. If the engine blows up because you haven't changed the oil, then that's not a warrantable defect and it's going to cost you 20 grand. So the 400 bucks is pretty cheap insurance. And if you buy a BMW for I don't know, 50, then you've got to expect to pay more for the service there because you're buying a premium product and that's just how that works. And, you know, you should also be aware that you don't void your warranty if you shop around for the service. You don't have to get it serviced at the dealer you purchased the car from. They all want your servicing business. And you can also get the car serviced independently and that will not void your warranty according to the ACCC as long as right. a qualified mechanic does it and they do it according to the schedule. Yeah. And the part you don't have to use genuine parts. The parts that you use, however, must be fit for purpose. So, mm. for example, you don't have to use a BMW oil filter to service your BMW, but you have to use an, a reputably branded oil filter designed for that BMW, mm. you know? Mm. And provided you go through all those checks and balances, you can shop around for service on your BMW if you're not prepared to pay the what you might consider to be the exorbitant cost of getting your local dealer to do that job. Mm. And a, a little message uh, about that, I actually work in the parts industry just in, in part-time. Uh, a lot of the branded service things you can buy, perhaps like a BMW oil filter, generally, again, made by a separate manufacturer and then BMW slap their label on it and then up the up the cost by 50%. And then another thing to consider when you're looking at different mechanics is that when you're going to the Toyota dealership, perhaps, uh, they might be paying their mechanics something like $26 an hour or whatever the standard award rate is. And then the, the dealership gets the labor cost on top of that. So when you're going to an independent mechanic, the labor costs are actually going directly to that mechanic. And I think in some respect, it, it makes logical sense that that's more incentive to do good work essentially on the car. But yeah, I think- it, hmm. it certainly does. And the other thing I'd say wearing my engineer's hat is that when you go to the local bloke, you actually get to talk to the guy who's had his hands on your car, whereas you don't get to do that at the dealership. So for example- if it's a 12-month service interval and they look at your car at the dealership and they say, those brakes, those brake pads look like they're only going to run for another six months, we're going to change them now because you're not going to be back for another 12 months and you are going to be a bit miffed if the brakes go down to the bare metal and you're up for, you know, the world and his brother worth of replacement parts. Whereas the guy who's had his hands on your car will say, look, mate, your brakes are getting a little bit thin here. And I reckon if you bring them back just before Christmas... I'll do it then and we should be sweet, you know? And that way you'll get another four or five months or whatever it is out of your brakes that are wearing out but aren't shot yet. And this is a kind of value proposition that you will not be offered if you get the genuine servicing at the dealership because they just don't work like that. Right. Well, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. We've taken nearly an hour of your time up and very generous of you to to talk to us and take us over so much of your expertise. And it's been fantastic. I was wondering if I can uh, also potentially invite you back at some stage because I really want to start drilling down on the future of the auto industry and what your thoughts are on electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and what all that might mean or might not mean for the price of gas or petrol, as Australians say. So there's a whole area of... Uh, potentially uh, uh, longer topics. Would you be welcome to come back at some stage, John? Yeah, Paul and Tim, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. I'm, I'm grateful that you've given me the opportunity to inflict myself upon your listeners, which is something <laughs> I always enjoy. Yeah. And if just one or two people out there on the cusp of buying a car benefit and save a few bucks, then hey, it's been all worthwhile. Brilliant. And I'd be more than happy to come back and talk to you about all of that stuff ad nauseum if you think there's some value in it. Oh, so yeah, absolutely. There definitely is. And we'll put all your coordinates on, on 
on the show notes, and I, I really highly recommend our listeners to uh, take some time to check check out John. He's got some fantastic stuff. Do you want to give us your best coordinates? Yeah, absolutely. You can uh, stalk me endlessly at my website, which is autoexpert.com.au, or you could check out and hopefully subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is autoexpert.com. TV. And that'd be an absolute pleasure as well. So once again, guys, thanks for having me on the podcast. Paul Street Journal. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.